Um, our next speaker is Andrea Mamone, our hometown historian of modern and contemporary Europe from University of Roma, La Sapienza, but who has an international scholarly trajectory. He's taught courses at Royal Holloway, University of London, has been a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania and the European University Institute, and that has been a fellow at Columbia University. Through his writing and via his prolific editorial work, Professor Mamone is shaping conversations about Italian politics, particularly about the politics of Italy's extreme right, both in English and in Italian. His book, Transnational Neo-Fascism in France and Italy, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2015. He was co-editor of the influential journal, Modern Italy, and the seminal Rutledge Handbook of Contemporary Italy, among many other publications. Professor Mamone has been invited to speak at a wide range of events organized by groups including the US Department of State and numerous international universities and organizations. He blogs for HuffPost Italia and has written articles for major news outlets including the, the Guardian, Al Jazeera, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Corriere della Sera, and CNN. Currently, Professor Mamone is editing the Rutledge Handbook of Modern Italian History and completing a book on Southern Italy and the myth of the Bourbons, which is due out with Mondadori. He's also been writing on the return of nationalism in Europe, and his talk today will treat this topic. Um, his talk is titled, Legitimizing Contemporary Right-Wing Nationalism. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrea Mamone to the podium. trying to steal George's presentation, which is much, much better than mine. As you can see, it's very good. Okay, great. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks for the nice presentation. And also, I would like to thank Marla for organizing this. And of course, the American Academy organizing this in an important year for Italy, but not just for Italy, because this you are talking a year about global history, because you know countries are not living a life alone in a little corner of the universe, but they are quite interconnected each other. So my speech is about part of the research that I'm doing that I don't know if I will ever finish, but you know, like, <laughs> that's part of, of the story. So it is about the legitimization and the use of violence. Uh, and I'll try to focus specifically on two cases. One is the storming of the Capitol Hill, very widely known everywhere, because I mean, it was during uh, the, the <laughs> as we know, you know, uh, Biden was about to become the president. Uh, of the United States. And another one is what Georgia just mentioned, is a little case, uh, which is the storming, again, of the CGL, which is the main uh, trade union in Italy, here in Rome, the headquarter. So what is similar and what is different? And how some parties and some media reacted to this? And in my view, this is telling us a lot about not just the legitimization, but also the mainstreaming, the normalization, the banalization, and also the acceptance of violence and anti-democratic cultures in the contemporary globe. 
So, as I said, this is an important, uh, this itself is an important year, but in reality, since, as we know, 1999, we have a number, uh, in this year we, have, we had, and we have a number of important anniversary because it is, there was the creation of the fascist party in Italy, and the fascist party uh, was in some ways uh, with Mussolini a template because it was the first real fascist dictatorship appearing in, uh, in the globe. And we have then the creation of the fascist party. And then we have this year, as I said, the march on Rome. So looking at the images that we have in uh, Washington DC, but also in Rome, but also in other area of not just Europe, because if we look today at, at Brazil or India, we see some strange stories and some strange images, which in some ways are recalling this dark past. But is this fascism? Is this not fascism? This is an important question, but maybe it's not the only question that we have today. So the storming of the, the attack of the Capitol Hill, it has been something, uh, as I said before, widely, widely uh, seen, uh, worrying many people, worrying many media and worrying obviously American citizens first, because I mean, it was the, their country in a key moment, which was you know, the, the, the passage of power from one administration to the other. Everything is certainly linked with the figure of Donald Trump, someone who some, uh, even, even international, international uh, observers said that you know, Trump, Trumpism was uh, finishing with Trump. Not really. So the, the, the uh, violent, violent started with the speeches in the morning when Trump and his son actually were saying something which was quite terrible, terrible for a, for a, for a president, terrible for someone who is a mainstream politician. So I'm not talking here about what Georgia said before. So Casa Pound, uh, these little you know, guys, uh, singing and so on. We are talking about the former president of the United States, the most powerful uh, uh, power in the globe, and the son of the guy, fundamentally saying to Republicans, I'm coming to find you in your house if you don't do what you are supposed to do. This is, I mean, if this was happening, if this was happening in Buenos Aires or in Rome, you know, the majority of even Republicans, uh, media would say that's fascism. The usual Italians or you know Argentina, okay, like the coups, the takeovers. But some people, as we know, they justified violence. And one of the problem is that when you legitimize, then it's very hard to go back, to take a step back. So. But the reality is that you know, there are investigations, and the reality is that the, the, there is a judicial system who is doing their job properly. And this is, for example, what a judge in a case against a Proud Boys, one of these militia uh, group, wrote. So this was a coordinated, in some ways, premeditated attack, which is not just violence itself. It is an attack against democracy. It is an attack against the political system, which you may call it as you want. That's authoritarianism, that's fascism. We might change names and call it, I don't know, Boy Scouts, but at the end of the day, the core of it is that the judicial system is, uh, is telling us the reality. And the story didn't actually start. I mean, some people started saying, well, we could not expect it. Well, maybe not, maybe not on that scale, which was incredible, of course. But what has been happening in the US since the election of Trump has been a rise of this type of militias and also a violence which was justified by wars. By wars once more, not from the uh, Casa Pound-like people. But the words were coming from uh, the, the core, the center of American politics. 
And as, as, as international observers were noticing it, also militias, US uh, white nationalists were noticing it. So there was even a kidnapping, an attempt kidnapping, sorry, of Michigan governor by, a, of course, you know, little group of people. They were meeting in their backyards, Boy Scouts again. And with Trump not legitimizing, because Trump was not responsible of this, but certainly, you know, challenging openly the governor in a way that then, because words are important, in a way that was, you know, at the end of the day, some people saying, well, someone at the top is criticizing, so let's act. And the action was kidnapping and maybe having other states, like, for example, Virginia, doing the same. So kidnapping or stopping a democratic process. How do we want to call it? Fascism, nationalism. It is not democracy anyway. And then we have Italy. Of course, Italy is a country that saw fascism, so probably we are more used to this. So we have a demonstration against the, the lockdown, against masks, against green pass, and all these things that unfortunately we are still uh, used. And the, a group called Forza Nuova, which is in some ways the oldest existing uh, far-right neo-fascist party in Italy without changing uh, name, was created in 1997. They are an openly neo-fascist group, as you can, as you can see from this picture, and also they are almost ultra-Catholic as well. They are not so big, and the, they are one of the groups infiltrating this new wave of protests, not just in Italy, but in a number of countries. Now, as I was aware that not everyone here was uh, familiar with them, I found a little video. Where it goes? Uh, can you show it? Because I can. Ah, let me show it. Let's see. Let's see what we're So now you can uh, see if even if it's not perfect. Uh, this is the day of the of the um, of the storming of the CGL of the main quarters of the CGL. This is a very short video, so you can see there were lots of people. This is Fiore, the leader of of, of uh, Forza Nuova. Fiore was uh, was uh, convicted for terrorism, escaped in London, was in Britain for many years, creating a sort of financial empire. Is uh, Castellito, Luciano Castellito, the Roman leader of, uh, of Forza Nuova. He couldn't be there because he's convicted. He couldn't uh, be in these public gatherings, but he was there, which is open lots of questions also on the role of the police allowing him to be, to be there. 
So they decided to go to the, to the QGL. It was not planned. So in any case, they had to discuss this with the Italian police who escorted them. And there are judges uh, today trying to find out who were these people in the police allowing them to move, to, to, to bring these demonstrations to the CGL, because that's, that's quite serious. They entered into the CGL, as you can see, something uh, violent, but certainly different from the storming of the Capitol Hill, also given the number of people. And now they are in uh, Kingston. Now, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not so close. I'm sorry. So, uh, Castellito, Castellino was the leader, uh, the Roman leader of Forza Nuova, said this, this to one of the policemen. Uh, Portateci Landini. Landini is the secretary, the national secretary of the CGL, of, of the trade union. So they were basically saying, bring Landini to us, or we will go there looking for him, finding him in some way. So, this is violence, it's, it's very hard to understand how the police allowed someone like them to get into the, uh, the, the, the quarter of the CGL. As, as, you know, one of the questions in terms of legitimization is how things were not planned properly in Washington to have, you know, a, a police force able to stop them. Because if we, people here in this room, we go now, to uh, the Camera dei Deputati, the Italian Parliament, they will arrest us immediately. So, you know, like five seconds, we will be probably jailed. So something uh, bizarre happened anyway in both cases. So once more, this is not a, a strange case. I mean, because what has been happening in Italy in the recent year, and they will go back to it at the, towards the end of my presentation is that if, even if we look just at the last elections in Italy, right-wing forces, neo-fascist forces were there, legitimized in some ways, as I will show through the media as well, making a sort of you know, a noisy, visible presence within the Italian public, including some act of what we can call terrorism. So once more, from this interwar fascism, now that we have the anniversary, to what? So are we expect to find these people or those people? No, and yes, at the same time. No, because certainly 1945 is not the end of the story. I mean, the chronology that we have, believing that, and as historians, sometimes we know, that properly. I mean, it's not that one year is, is meaning the end of the story. There are culture, there are people, there are ideas. There are even generations of people perpetuating some of this, that we cannot say that 45 was the end, as we cannot say that from the 60s, for example, or from the 80s, there was a new, uh, completely new world, because, I mean, this take times, and sometimes even in terms of dressing, uh, symbols, and so on, we see the, or the return or the, the endurance of some ideas. We certainly are modernized or contemporized because violence today is not the same violence as in the past because we wouldn't allow uh, you know, a group of bunch of people taking a tank and coming uh, here to try to, to, to occupy this space. So there is also a, a, a wider public uh, uh, rejection, let's say, in some ways of this. But unfortunately, we need to pay attention as, as observers and, and as intellectuals because there is an ongoing legitimization of some of this stuff. So along with this idea of fascism today, we have a number of other concepts, a number of other 
tools that we need to keep in mind, including what is populism, if populism can be used to legitimize sometimes some of these forces, because if you call someone populist, it's not the same as calling someone you are fascist or even you are a Nazi. Plus, there is all this issue of xenophobia, which became again, especially in the last, in the last years in Europe with the waves of immigration, in the US especially, under Trump, even if it was a problem existing before, but certainly in the public eyes. Now we need to consider that there is a globe, that there is a universe of this uh, galaxy, which can go under this uh, sort of label far right or something similar uh, to that. But if we want to focus on violence, and here I just put up a few examples. I've not considered everything because I don't consider Breivik. I've not put what happened in New Zealand, what happened in the US, even because you know there is this strange idea that when a, a, an Islamist is, 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 is committing a bombing, he is a terrorist. When he's doing this from the far right, he's a lone, mad uh, human being. Well, certainly mad, certainly human being, but sometimes these people are inspiring each other, are reading some of the same material are saying that they are doing because they read, because they were active in blogs, in blogs including in Europe, with the, the contribution of American, of American uh, speakers, of American bloggers, defending, for example, Europe against, against Islam. So with all this imaginary going back to Lepanto, to Vienna, and so on. So, I mean, the, 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 the history is full of this people of this culture rejecting democracy. Since 1943, when Italy was started being liberated in some ways with the armistice and so on, there were fascists trying to make subversion, reverting the order. And then we have groups in Italy, and we will talk about them uh, uh, today and tomorrow, uh, also like New Order, which was banned, and there was the discussion that uh, Giorgia mentioned on Forza Nuova, well, it was banned, it was banned also because there was a trial, not because the <laughs> politicians decided that, you know, that was fascism. And then we have a number of violence perpetuated in Greece in the past with the colonel, but also today with Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn who was at some point the third party in the Greek parliament who is convicted because it was made by criminals, by people committing crimes, including murdering people. And they were, and some of them, they had links with the state. So there is a full story here, excluding the big, huge examples, which are telling us that uh, there is a, a resurgence or an enduring space made by anti-democratic violent cultures in our democratic societies. Interestingly, even the virus, even the coronavirus has been infiltrated and hijacked by these, 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 these forces. This is the case of Forza Nova saying that you know, the revolution has, it will not stop. And these are the, 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 the banners from the youth wing, for example, again, students to be free, no green pass. And interestingly, the people in Michigan who were willing to kidnap the governor, no lockdown and lockdown. So there is a sort of, you know, this fight, one of the most interesting thing is, you know, this fight for freedom by groups who are not for, for freedom, <laughs> they are authoritarian. Uh, people like Forza Nuova, if they were under fascism, they would at least send to, a, to, to I don't know, to, to a little island because they were not obeying the order made by, by Benito Mussolini. So, but still there is this idea that this group are talking about freedom, about liberty across, across the West. So this is not an American or an Italian uh, case. But when we talk about how to understand all of this, how to read all of this, what I notice as an international observer, someone who studied fascism as well, is that you know, sometimes in the US there is this idea of exceptionalism. The US is different, democracy is very strong. And you know, what's happening in the US is different. Well, it's not just a US case. France is the same, Britain is the same, Italy is not the same for other, <laughs> for other reasons. We have other problems. Uh, but you know, this, the, what happens is not possible. It happened in the past, other times, 
and in Italy, maybe, in Buenos Aires, in Germany, and so on, so other places. And you know, this is the victory of an old academic interpretation that fascism has a meaning only in Italy. Outside of it, zero, nothing, it's something different. A global context, people crossing borders, ideas crossing borders is not existing. But at least, at least, we were discussing yesterday to, to our dinner, at least what Trump made, made you know, a discussion again <laughs> possible. And the problem is the legitimization coming from the Republican Party. So not uh, Forza Nuova and, and uh, Casa Pound. Here we have a party, a mainstream party, and this is telling us a lot, not just in the US, but look at what is happening in Britain, in Hungary, in Poland, how mainstream parties become something different, purging people against the leader or purging people, censoring people, and saying that what happened in uh, in, in January is something a legitimate political action, which is like, you know, saying it is good to do that. In Italy, there is a similar and different pro uh, problem, is that, you know, we have this idea that Italians are good people and the Germans are the bad ones. So we have another type of problem in terms of memory, but certainly there is still this idea that, you know, it happened in the past. Contemporary parties are different. So what happened is that, as Giorgia mentioned, uh, Giorgia Meloni and Matteo Salvini, they were the ones saying, well, you know, we are not sure if this is fascism, we are against both the left and the right. But here we are talking about the right, we're not talking about the left. And one of the problem is that things have been legitimized also by people like Silvio Berlusconi, who legitimized these political forces into the system. Indeed, when there was a vote to ban uh, Forza Nuova, Forza Italia, Berlusconi's party was among them. And then we have the media in Italy inviting in the past people like Roberto Fiore, the leader of Forza Nuova. And similarly, in the US, you have channels promoting some of these far right ideas because, I mean, this is simply far right. And then, just to end, we have also sometimes academics bringing uh, legitimization. Here it is an article published recently now, disappeared, you know about a strange situation, a quoting anti-fascism and fascism. And then I have to say, you know, I have the privilege because I have, uh, I know some of the people writing it to be only in a small footnote in this book. This book is written by two colleagues, I mean, two nice people as well. In this book, they fundamentally are saying that uh, they want to uh, find uh, new scholarly natives to uh, study the far right. Well, this is a book fundamentally saying that uh, uh, what happens in January is not something wrong. Thank you very much. <laughs>